Halloween is coming. The Bears will spend their Halloween afternoon at Soldier Field hosting the San Francisco 49ers. I'm Dan Wiederer. That's Rich Campbell. Rich, I see your title. What have you seen before? Seen it before, man. I've seen 38 to 3. I've seen that lever loss, right, that we talked about last week, a lever game go really badly and where it goes from there. I've seen it before. We'll see if we'll see it again. Yeah, I mean, this is por that portion of the schedule where you say, boy, does this thing go just straight downhill? Is it, you know, like a sled hill that's got a pump, a little uptick? You know, wh wh where where does it go? But I think ultimately right now things are pointing in a direction where it doesn't feel like there are solutions for the long term that make you feel good that this season is going to be rescued. And then that makes you ask questions about deeper into the future. Yeah, and we'll get into the Bears 49ers matchup here in, in just a minute, but they actually seem to be catching a break with the schedule, the way the 49ers are playing and the way they're injured. So uh, maybe a game that looked daunting, right, as part of a slide is, is a bit of a, a respite for them. Well, you're, you're owed a break after you play Rodgers and Brady in back-to-back -back weeks, That's right? Like the, the football gods point. probably owe you one. And, and Tom Brady certainly did everything that we thought he was going to do. And, and, you know, I talked on a previous video with Miller about the, just the predictability of that game in Tampa. The fact that it was 21 to nothing after the first quarter was it was just one of those things where you just stop and you go, of course, it's 21 to nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, this really good football team is taking this really struggling football team and having their way with them. And then it just leaves you in this place. I looked over at my colleague, Colleen Kane from the Chicago Tribune after Brady threw his third of four first hand touchdown passes. And I said, Colleen, it's the first half of week seven, right? And, and to your point about seeing it before, like you get that feeling where you're like, this thing is just wayward. And it's not getting corrected with the people in place that are in charge of correcting it. So now with 11 weeks left on the schedule and 10 games, what do you do with that? And that, that's what I'll, I'll uh, ask you. And, and obviously we'll get into our picks here in a minute. Well, th there's a couple thoughts here. And if the Bears are uh, th that, that middle of the road team, right, that you expect to take a whooping when they play the Super Bowl champs or the conference champs, even the division champs. Okay, well, then you th that's expected, right? And then you expect them to bounce back when the competition is a little bit more to their level, which the 49ers are, right? So I think, if anything, we'll learn more about them this Sunday than we did the last couple, right? Because we knew they were overmatched, outclassed in that matchup last week. But what do they what do they do against a San Francisco team that's lost four in a row that comes in without its left tackle, without its best tight end, its top receiver is ailing? Can they score? You know, can Justin Fields get it going against that team? If they can't, then boy, all the all the problems that you sense coming out of Tampa, they're just just multiply them, right? Because then it's not getting any better. Well, well, the 49ers have issues, but the Bears do as well. We don't know whether Khalil Mack is going to play. We don't know whether Khalil Mack is going to play again before Thanksgiving at this stage. With the, his foot injury that's ailing, they've got to make some some long-term decisions on how much to push him through a stretch where, you know, obviously Khalil is one of these warriors that's going to try to play on game day every single week if he can. But there comes a point where it's a diminishing returns if you're just going to be a 500 team and you're using this fuel to get this guy to try to grind out games that you're losing 30, 38 to three like a week ago, right? And so it's a, it's a predicament here uh, that they welcome Robert Quinn back off the COVID-19 list. We don't know if Matt Nagy is gonna be back off the COVID-19 protocol by game time on Sunday. And so for every sort of issue that the 49ers have, the Bears can sort of match that and say, yeah, we've got that too. We've got issues too. And so I don't know, man, this game sets up to be a, a strange one. Uh, before we get into the, the selections, I'm just curious what you would do if you were George McCaskey and you looked at this and you said, we've got 10 weeks left in the season and you wanted to try to figure out what do I need to glean from these, these final 10 games to figure out direction for my franchise? What, what are you evaluating? What are you assessing? And it can't just be the final results, wins and losses against mediocre teams like the 49ers and, and you know, the Lions up the road and, and the Vikings at some point and, and these other teams that they'll play that they will be, you know, capable of beating. Yeah, it goes immediately to Justin Fields' production. So you go back, right, a rookie who wasn't the getting starters reps in training camp, right, and, and he begins the season as the backup and, and he takes over. Okay, there's a learning curve. There's an on-ramp there. The, the, any notion that he was going to succeed right out of the gate, take the lead by storm, was unlikely, and it didn't happen. 
I'll, I'll quote another uh, failed Bears coach here. When it's, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. That John Fox <laughs> used to say that quite a bit. And you need to say it in the John Fox voice for it to have credence. It's, it's, it's not how you start, huh? It's how you finish. There you go. Now you got it. Thank you. All right, what'd you now it resonated. You? Okay, yeah. So, uh, and, and that's the case with Fields, though. If he is ascending and you feel it, you see it, it's unmistakable over the final six weeks, it's going to change the evaluation at the end of the year compared to where it is right now. That's the biggest thing. But at some point, you know, you're pulling that lawnmower string. You're pulling that lawnmower string. At some point, it's got to go and, and catch, right? It's got to rev up. And and so, okay, you didn't see it in Tampa. They've got a fantastic front seven on defense. When the competition is more on the Bears level, you've got to see those plays. You've got to see the points. Well, let's score some points, right? You you did that bit with uh, Dion Miller in one of your in your video earlier this week about charting right. touchdown passes, right? let's have a two touchdown pass game. Let's have a four touchdown pass game. You got right? three for the season. That's incredible. I, I mean, that says it all right there. If that number doesn't start to incline steeply, that's where I'm looking if, if I'm George McCaskey. So go to Fields' play and you need to start seeing the pains, right? Because they're unmistakable pains. They've got to become growing pains. You've got to see the growth from those. And if you don't, you're going back to square one. You're, you're going you're gonna to blow it up, and, and you're going to start again with someone you believe might take your quarterback forward. So when you come on the program, we always have to jump in the DeLorean, go back in the time machine, and take you to a place that maybe you don't really want to go to. But I'm going to take you back to 2016 and 2017 just because you gave us the entry point with that John Fox impersonation. And those are two years that you lived through on the beat with the Chicago Bears and two years where the offense was not exactly – the one that was setting the NFL on fire. 2016, I wrote this in my storylines package on chicagotribune.com for this weekend. They checked into training camp with uh, Jay Cutler, Brian Hoyer, Connor Shaw. There's a fourth quarterback that I'm missing there. It's not Matt Barkley. He was not because later. he came afterwards. Later. And, th and then he ended up being their leading passer for the season starting the final six games. And it was just a mess where it went from Cutler to Hoyer, back to Cutler, then eventually to Barkley. The whole thing was was – Upside down, sideways. They won three games that entire year. They were three and thirteen. Wasn't a good offense. The next year, they drafted Mitch Trubisky, number two overall. And you remember the pride that John took in protecting Mitch Trubisky in a, from a standpoint of, hey, some games we're not even going to throw the ball at all. There's that win over the Carolina Panthers that you remember well, where Eddie Jackson scores the two defensive touchdowns, and Trubisky threw the ball seven times the entire day, completed four of them, and Foxy was proud of that. He kept talking about it for months, but, hey, we won a game when we only threw seven passes. That Those two offenses were head and shoulders above this current version in terms of passing offense. That 2017 offense averaged 175 passing yards per game, dead last in the NFL, 32nd, however you want to call it, the worst. That was 50 passing yards per game higher than what the current 2021 Bears offense is, is averaging. It's mystifying, Rich. And so I don't know how you get this thing unlocked to a level that makes anyone feel good about it. We're talking about seeing growth in Justin Fields. Well, the starting point is just having a functional passing offense. They've been in chase games the last two weeks against the Packers and the Buccaneers. When you're down by 32 points at halftime, that is a tailor-made game for you to put up 330 passing yards because you're just chasing the entire second half. The opposing defense is giving you a bunch of underneath completions, and you roll it up. They've gone seven games to open the season, Rich, without topping 200 net passing yards in a game. That's staggering. You lived through those 2016-2017 offenses. This one is worse by a country mile. That's unbelievable. Yeah, that's really that's really uh, stark relief, right, about how, how bad this is. It's roster construction, it's coaching, it's execution, right, all of it. And that's the type of thing that is going to lead George McCaskey to hit the detonator button at the end of the season if those numbers hold up. And, and to that point, right, any type of significant turnaround, not only would you say that's what it's going to take for everyone to save their jobs, but it's unforeseen. There's no reason to predict that that's going to happen because we have this huge body of work here, offensive line problems, you've got a rookie quarterback, uh, group of receivers that for whatever reason aren't on track. So yeah, w would you put it past them that they they break out in a, in a way that we don't see right now? Not necessarily, but it's it's unlikely. And even when they do it, right? Let's say they go out against San Francisco this weekend and, and you know, eclipse 300 passing yards and three, four passing touchdowns. Their <laughs> refrain, of course, will be do it again. 
Yeah, right. You got to do it again. You can't just be right. a, a flash, right? Because we saw the flashes in 2017 with Mitch Trubisky looking like they were about to take a step forward, but the consistency wasn't there. And so, yeah, the the, the water is hot. The seat is hot. Uh, it, it's a, it's a very urgent time for them. So let's get into the picks because the Buccaneers, sure. I'm sorry, the, the 49ers, as you mentioned, have lost four straight. They haven't won since week two, and yet they come on the road to Soldier Field as four-point favorites. That tells you what the rest of the world thinks about the Chicago Bears right now, yeah. and that is staggering. Uh, that line jumps off the page uh, in this week's lines. I just The Bears would be four-and-a-half-point underdogs at home in in our episodes of the window previously we looked ahead to this game assuming the bears would be favored and i'm going to stick with that not necessarily saying that the bears would win although i do think at plus 170 they're a pretty good money line pick this week but i'm going to take the bears and the points just because the 49ers are limping in themselves i you know how i feel about kyle shanahan as an offensive mind yeah. offensive coach i think the world of them I, I think any team would be lucky to have him as as their head coach and certainly sometimes hard to cool coach. you down when you start talking about kyle I, I like kyle a lot i had a chance to cover him for for a few years in washington and and learned a lot of football from him and, and understand the way he puts defenders in conflict is just excellent you see it in the way sean mcveigh does it in uh, los angeles coming from that same coaching tree so i have a lot of respect for kyle but they're I just can't believe they're favored <laughs> as much as they are. So uh, give me the points, and I'll take the Bears to, to normalize here. I think they're probably depressed in the market because of how ugly that looked last Sunday. Marty, Marty! This time machine can also take you back to the last time that the 49ers played at Soldier Field, and Robbie Gold scored all the points for the 49ers and kicked five field goals and beat the Bears 15-14. to 14. You remember that one as well. I'm also taking the Bears with the points, but actually picking the 49ers to win this game. I've, I've got it as a 23-20 to 20 total in my official prediction at chicagotribune.com. That's an over, uh, I, right? That goes over if this is 40. That goes man. over. I, okay. I cannot bring myself to pick the Bears in their current state of disarray. I've tried to rationalize it in 115 different ways this week and saying, like, look, this is the game to get right with. But just there just seems to be a level of not just desperation, but but they just seem lost in their grasp for answers. Justin Fields tells us in his Wednesday press conference that he knows a – uh, offensive breakthrough is very close. And I said, what are, what's the evidence that, that tells you that? And he says, just a feeling, <laughs> you know, and you're like, okay, well, too many times in the past, we've had feelings that don't exactly equate to anything, right? We've heard all about great practice weeks that result in 15 point losses for this team. And so just, there's just, there's little trust that they have got it right in a week where their head coach is, you know, isolated due to COVID-19 and they're scrambling and they're struggling. They're trying to figure out who's going to play right tackle. Didn't figure that out last week when Elijah Wilkinson was a late scratch and the whole thing just seems mess. So I'll take the bears and the points, but I'm not picking them to win. We'll what move you, on. What do you think about them? Plus 170 on the money line though. Hold that thought, please. Right. Well. <laughs> the game of the week this week is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So we just watched hammer the bears last week, 38 to three. They go on the road to play the new Orleans saints. Interesting matchup here. A good late afternoon game on Sunday to, to pull up the chair. Do what's your thoughts here? I think the Buccaneers are awesome. And I watched uh, you know, the, the Bears game against the Bucs on Sunday and then all of New Orleans on Monday night against the Seahawks where this, the Saints offense was abysmal. I can't believe this is only four and a half points. I'm shocked. Uh, I am taking the Bucs and I will lock it from our next category as well. Wow. I'm that I'm confident that the Bucs are going to steamroll them. A double up. I like, I like the, uh, the confidence factor. Yeah. I'm also picking the Bucs minus the four and a half. I thought that they played okay offensively against the Bears on Sunday. It wasn't yeah. even a, a crisp, sharp performance, right? And they won by 35 points. And Tom Brady gets in the post game afterwards and says, "Look, they're, you know, they say, why are you still playing in the fourth quarter?" He says, "Because we weren't sharp. You know, we weren't. We have things to clean up. We're eyeing something a lot more than a 35 point blowout of the Chicago Bears in October. We're trying to win a second consecutive Super Bowl. And so when you're in that mindset, you're trying to make sure that every possession means something toward the end goal." Love teams that are in that mindset. Bruce Arians said, look, we could have scored 20 more, right? And he wasn't wrong. It could have been 50 to three, you know, really easily. It could have been 50 to three. And I love the fact that they believe that. I love the fact that they feel that way. They're going to beat the Saints handily. As you I said. have not seen that before. Never. <laughs> I've never been around a, I've never been around a team that was that focused on the prize with such realistic ambition. You know, I, I, 
can't say that I have in a different sport. Covering sure. North Carolina and, and Duke National Championship basketball teams, when, you, when you're around a group that, that gets that big picture view of things, it's really cool because those grooves can be really uh, fun to witness from, a, from the side. And you say, boy, that's, that's, that's some fun stuff. All right, you've given us your lock already. I am going with a lock close to your home. I'm going to take the Indianapolis Colts minus two and a half against okay. the Titans. This is one of those lines that jumps right off the page for you because you're sitting there going, okay, the Titans are rolling, right? They've had a couple really emotional wins here. They play the Bills. They play the Chiefs. They, they, they've got themselves on a groove. Why is this a two-and-a-half-point line? You say, well, because it's a two-and-a-half-point line because it's a division matchup. The Colts are, are getting themselves on uh, steady ground here. Carson Wentz is playing better, and there's just something there that tells me that the Colts are going to take care of business. Yeah, if you wanted to go with the Titans in this game, you'd take the money line, right, and just just roll the dice on that. I believe it's plus 130. But you know I'm I'm a Colts backer. Uh, I, I believe in that team. They hooked me up with my money line upset uh, last week, finally got over the, the hump as opposed to the game they blew against the Ravens. But uh, I'm with you. I'd pick the Colts in this game. Um, some some big spreads out there this week. So the, 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 my pick of the Bucks jumped out far and away um, as my most confident pick. I, I still like where you're headed. I got that. All right. The upset pick here. I thought there were some choices here. You asked me previously about the Bears. Anytime you've got a home team against a team that's lost four straight at plus 170, you look at that and you go, boy, that's worth considering. I've already given you my 49ers win prediction, so I cannot in good conscience then tell you take the Bears at 170. But, hey, if you want to do that, I've got no qualms against it. Okay. The Patriots plus 170 this week against the Chargers. That's a game that's intriguing. Patriots seem to be uh, kind of getting their, their, their groove themselves with, with turning Mac loose against a feeble Jets team last week and saying, hey, let's go, uh, let's go hang 50 on them and see what kind of momentum we can build. But I'm going with the Steelers plus 165 at Cleveland. So many injury questions right now for the Browns. We don't know what Baker Mayfield's status is going to be. If he plays, he's going to be wearing a harness. He's got a torn labrum and a fractured humerus in the non-throwing shoulder. Seems painful to me. Mm -hmm. uh, they also have missed Nick Chubb for the last two weeks. He's trying to work back into action too. There's just some question marks right now with, with where the Browns are at health-wise. In a division game against the feisty Steelers team, that's the one that I'm taking. Steelers plus 165. I've got the same thing written down. Uh, they're three and a half point dogs and they're coming off a bye week, right? You, you get Mike Tomlin's group seems to play pretty well when they're underdogs. I'm with you. I crossed out bears and I wrote Steelers. So I'm on, we're on the right. same, same train there. All right. Teaser, tease me. All right, here, here we go. Uh, I'm, I'm going to tease Rams Texans down to nine and a half. Davis Mills is going to start again for the Texans. I know there was some thinking that Tyrod Taylor might might take back over, and at which point I would back away from the Texans, just stay away, let let them reestablish what they are, because I think Tyrod Taylor can cover some spreads, right? He'll score for you, maybe get in the back door. But with Davis Mills again, and the Rams taking a long time to get going against the Lions last week, uh, I like them to, to come out and play well, nine and a half, bring that down. And then tease it with... Uh, the Bengals and Jets bring the total down to 37. I think okay. uh, I think they'll. I think Cincinnati will push that forward enough to, uh, to get that over 37. So Rams laying nine and a half and Bengals Jets over a teased down total of 37. I've got some thoughts on that Jets game here in a minute, mm -hmm. uh, but I got to give you my teaser first. And this one goes back to what we just talked about. The Bears tease that up to 10. You get a home team playing a team that that, that has lost four in a row, and you got yeah, them up in double digits. I would not put it. Pa I wouldn't put it past the Bears to win, and I also wouldn't put it past them to score a field goal again. <laughs> no question, no question. But you, yeah. you take the ten, and then I'm going to take the Cowboys plus nine at Minnesota. This line has been all over the place because there's some uncertainty about Dak Prescott's status, and un understandably so. Dak Prescott seems to be eager and willing to play. There seems to be people above him saying, listen, this is a season that's got huge potential, and we want to make sure that whatever you're dealing with right now doesn't linger for a month or two. So they're probably going to go the, the cautious route, and that thrusts Cooper Rush in, in, into his first NFL start. I, you, you look at you go, who the Cooper? Cooper Rush is going to start for them? Uh, who knows what Dak's calf strain does to him? But he also seems sort of eager to play. And so if he does sort of – 
urge his way into the lineup. Now you're taking a, a Dallas team that was favored by three points heading into the week, and then you're getting them at plus nine with their starting quarterback playing. So it's a strange sort of situation here. Who knows where it goes? Yeah. Uh, you also feel like if any team is able to withstand the loss of their starting quarterback, it's a team that has a top-tier running back like Ezekiel Elliott and can reinvent themselves on the fly. You like the things that they've done offensively down there and their ability to be creative. So that's it. Bears plus 10, Dallas plus 9. That's my teaser. And, and I don't think the Vikings would just uh, put the gas pedal down and pull away from the Cowboys. You know, you don't see the Vikings scored 40. Yeah. And the Vikings are one of these teams that can't figure out yet, right? Mm -hmm. Like they, they could legitimately be a team that we look at in mid-December and go, oh man, they're in the playoffs. Good for them, right? Like they found themselves. Or they're a team where you say, uh, Mike Zimmer, uh, hope your time in Minnesota was nice. You're on the way out the door. You know, they're just, it's just a team that I, I don't know which direction they're going to pick at their fork in the road. We're going just got? for fun here. Yeah. What and, do you got for your fun? This? And I'm going with the Colts. Um, it's the, it's a meaningful game here in, in Indianapolis. Uh, of course, with the Titans leading the division and the Colts trying to play catch up, just trying to get themselves back into the race. And uh, I'll have my eye on that one just personally. And so I wanted to pick it and taking the Colts for the reasons you said. Uh, I think they're playing better. Would not surprise me if Tennessee won. So I would take them on the money line. Also wouldn't have a problem if you had put the Titans in a teaser and took them down to eight and a half. Because I okay. think they'll still be in that game. Yeah, so... I've got so I was kind of flip flopping the lock and the just for fun because sometimes it doesn't really matter what category you put it in, but it kind of does matter what category you put it in because it's you're just, trying to be fun for you. So this is not that fun, and it's oh. why I was I've got arrows on my note card here. You're not gonna be able to see it, but there's arrows, they're drawn all over the place. The Broncos minus three against the Washington football team. I'm of the belief that you are that the Washington football team is a disaster, they're one and six against the spread this year they just don't seem like they have anything going for them whatsoever and i know the broncos aren't exactly world beaters but man if you can't figure so yourselves out against that team then then i don't know what to tell you they're only laying three at home uh feels like a a good place to to, to bounce back for big fangio that's where i'm at i don't know how fun that is it doesn't really yeah. seem that fun that, of all the game games this weekend that's like 17 14. i think the total that's that why i was kind of drawing the arrow because i'm like that's not fun like i mean that's just a thing so. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's an interesting coaching matchup between uh, veteran coaches, you know, Vic Fangio and Ron Rivera, guys who have been around a really long time. Their seasons on the brink in, in separate ways, and the Broncos have a long rest coming off a of previous Thursday night game. So, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pick Washington at, in any circumstance right now. Uh, I just think they stink. But yeah, Denver doesn't also inspire you. I, I, I'll, I'll be interested to see. You know, Vic's guys can. Can can cover for you. All right. What do you got on Saturday? Saturday oh, special. I'm a, I'm a wreck. I'm a wreck on Saturday. I think I've got two two correct all season. So I'm gonna I'm gonna roll the dice again here. Hey, correct me if I'm wrong. Were you robbed last week on that bogus unsportsmanlike conduct call in the Iowa State? Was it Iowa State Oklahoma State? Oh yeah. It was it over? You picked the over. I was, didn't. You were barely under, right? And was that touchdown the difference? A hundred percent, it was the difference. I, I didn't know. So, if they, I didn't know if they went on to score on that possession anyway. The, no, they did not on that possession. Oh, they gosh. scored again later, Brutal. and that game was back and forth and had all sorts of things going on. But I was on Brutal. the plane, uh, getting ready to go to Tampa, and I learned about that play on Twitter. And then you watch it, you know, pretty quickly. To your point, it's the Iowa State receiver, right? Like he gets in the clear, and he basically just looks back to see who's behind him, takes a second glance back, and then. Then he's just I mean, kind of like, oh, man. Kind of, like, yeah. kind of slowed up at the goal line, right? And the college football rule on that is so dumb to take the touchdown away, right? Like, if you want to call in sportsman like contact, assess it on the right. kickoff. And, like, right. you know what I mean? Like, but but to change a game, to take a score off of the board, because it got, like, I never saw if there was ever any explanation given by officials, any apology given, if, if anybody beefed on it. But, man, uh, I think I tweeted it. I think I tweeted a, yeah, a retweet of the video it. that with the – <laughs> Yeah, uh, WTF brutal. because it just whether whether I was on that game or not, like that is just absurd. But yeah, so anyway, give us your college. Your college All right, pick. I'm going under Iowa Wisconsin 36 and a half. That's low. Yeah, that's that's a very low total. Uh, you, you wouldn't put it past any 11 a.m. Big Ten start right to be like six three. So I get that. That's fine. Those, the the noon or 11 a.m. Big Ten slots are sometimes painful games there, but. Iowa's defense can score. Wisconsin showed life last week. Uh, Iowa did not in getting whipped at Purdue uh, or get against Purdue. But I just think that's low. I mean, that's 
even 20 to 17 gets over that. So I'll, I'll go over 36 and a half. All right. I like that. I had a couple circled here on the college things. There's a, uh, there's a, a, a North Carolina name over that's worth looking at. Uh, there's an Appalachian state under against Louisiana Monroe that, that maybe there's some insider information that says that could be an app state blowout with a good okay. defensive performance, okay. but I'm going with the Nittany lions plus 18 and a half at Ohio state. I know that Penn state is coming off a nine overtime loss to the Illini last week. That game was wild. It actually delayed my departure to the airport. Cause I was like, I'll just stay till the end of the second overtime. And you're like, wait, that's the, Oh, now they only run one play. The, the whole rule, the whole new rule in college where it's just one play per overtime after the third one and it's just yeah. like full-on chaos, is it, it, it was ridiculous. And those teams looked like they just wanted to stay out there forever, continuing to stumble all over themselves. They weren't even scoring. I don't know how much of that you followed, but it was outrageous. Guys are dropping game-winning touchdown passes. The whole thing was a mess. Illinois ends up pulling it out 20 to 18 in nine overtimes. You expect that total to be higher in nine overtimes, but that's where it was. My brother, my brother actually went to the window on the uh, under in okay. that game, and that's the reason I found out what happens. He texted me, and he was like, "By the grace of God," and I was like, nine OTs, thirty-eight right. points." I think there's a new rule I don't know about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because the old rule, yeah, I mean that with nine OTs, it would have been like you know still seventy to sixty, before, yeah. but something yeah. like that. But Penn State was a top five team not very long ago, right? I mean, they're <laughs> they're in a little bit of a, a tailspin here, but a top five team ought to be able to get themselves up for a game against Ohio State, at least to keep it within two touchdowns, yeah. right? And so that's my logic there. 18 and a half uh, should be an entertaining afternoon of college football on Saturday. And that's that, That's where I'm leaning this week. Don't feel, uh, don't feel great about the entire sheet here. Sometimes you get hit that mid-season thing where you look at everything and you go, boy, I felt better handing this in to the teacher before, but, you know. <laughs> but sometimes that's when, that's when you have the best weeks. I well, I, I will I will remind you of this that you know we used to have a, a amongst some of the reporters within the Bears beat an NFL just for fun kind of pool up there, and I get I hit a, a struggle one week that I it got so bad that I called my mother in law who knows nothing about the NFL to make my picks for me that week. She went like eleven and three, and then from that point on, the snowball. Hold on, I kept picking after that. I just needed that one week break for someone to take the steering wheel. You know, it's like you're driving. It's like when we yeah, would go to Green yeah. Bay, you know, you're driving home and you hit the rumble strips and you're like, can you just drive for 20 minutes? You know, like just, just give me a break and then I'll, I'll take it from here. That was kind of what that was like. Well, you let us know if someone else is making your picks and we can put an asterisk on him or bring him on the show and have him talk. Yeah, well, him. listen, we've got a special guest in Moneyline Ryan. If he ever wants to come on the show, he'll give you the straight up picks. Uh, he was very upset Thursday evening about the, the Cardinals' inability to look for a game-winning touchdown pass in the closing seconds. Not sure if you saw A.J. Green get basically hit in the back shoulder pad and the game ends with the Packers interception in the end zone. Elon Ryan was on the Cardinals on Thursday night and was none too pleased on Friday morning when he watched the finish of that game on the DVR. So if you ever need him to come on, we'll, we'll invite him and, and, and have him uh, give us the rundown. Hey, we, we can take all the help we can get. Yeah. Well, before you go to the window, come to the window. We've been rolling a little bit. We're going to try to keep it going, despite my uh, disclaimer there that it might be a rough week. We'll get it going. And enjoy Halloween at Soldier Field. Good luck, everybody. I, I always enjoy Halloween. Thanks.